Mr. McCore here with part seven of Possess Me. In the back of my mind, all I can hear is the ghost's voice telling me it's time to begin. Time to begin. Whenever I blink, all I see is Jake's face, and that's not a face I want to see when I close my eyes. I don't know what it means. All I know is I want to tell my parents to leave me alone. All I know is that the ring burns and buzzes against my finger, fills my veins with fire, with anger. That anger has filled me ever since Jim, so much that I avoided Javier. I couldn't stand his questions, his concerned looks. Actually, I say now to my parents, you're right. I'm not feeling well. I think I'm going to try to go to bed. I don't need to look at their faces to know they look at each other with concern. I can feel it. Just as I don't have to look at my untouched plate to know that I don't want to eat. They say it's my favorite, and in some corner of my mind I know it should be. But it all looks disgusting. I'm hungry for something else. I also know that if I stay here much longer, I'm going to say something I'll regret later. My parents mumble some sort of acknowledgement, but I'm already up and heading toward my room. When I get there, sleep is the last thing on my mind. The buzz of the ring has grown to a roar in my head, a surge that's settled under my skin, an electricity that threatens to tear me apart. I pace back and forth in my room, trying not to make too much noise, but unable to keep still. I keep glancing at the artifacts lovingly arranged on their glass shelves. I keep wondering why I collected them in the first place. They're junk each and every one of them. I want to throw them all away. I pause in front of an antique mirror, feel my vision waver as I look into the warped glass. I see my reflection staring back. I see the face of a young kid. I see the face of the one-eyed boy. I don't know which is mine. It's time to begin again, I say to myself. My reflections smile. What does Caden mean when he says, it's time to begin again? Share with your fellow listener. I dream I'm walking, walking through my hometown. It is late, deep night. My town feels abandoned. It's sticky and hot in the dream, but the sensation is far removed. As is the feeling of the cracked concrete underneath my bare feet. I stalk down the empty street, my fists clenched and resolve burning in my chest. It's time to begin. It's time to begin. In the dream, I am walking through a nearby neighborhood. I pass a fence with a dog sleeping out front. In the real world, the Doberman would have leaped and growled at me. But in the dream, it cowers as I pass, whimpering and running away. Blink. And I am in a house, in front of a house, single story, Ranch Rambler, white siding, picket fence, flickering porch light. I've seen it before. I know every part of Marshall Junction. I know who lives here. I stay to the shadows. I walk around the back. I pause outside the window. I look inside and smile. Blink. I shuffle away, back through the shadows. It is harder now with this weight atop me. Harder, but not impossible. In the dream, I am strong, much stronger than when I'm awake, much faster too. Trees scratch up around me, the slivered moon casting bare light on the tangled ground. It shouldn't be enough to see, but I see everything in the sharpest of details. The bats sweeping between branches, crickets scurrying beneath leaves, my prize fluttering his eyelids. Hush now, I whisper, sleep, we are nearly there. He groans, but my influence is strong. He slumbers. Blink. We are there. The manor rises before me, the blackened remains scratching at the sky. I bring him inside, down the blackened hallway, toward the cellar door. He stirs. What? What are you? He grumbles. I drop him from my shoulders on the concrete floor in the blackened cellar. Wait here, I tell him. Be a good boy and wait. Who, he asks. Sleep overtakes him once more. I lean him against the wall. When I leave and lock the door behind me, I begin to whistle. 
This will be easier than I thought. Did you hear? Javier asks at lunch the next day. I'm not nearly as grumpy as I was yesterday, and he took my apology in stride. Not the first time I've been moody, and probably not the last. Hear what? I reply. He looks around conspiratorially, even though there is no one within hearing distance. Jake is missing, he says. I shrug. I've never cared about Jake. Why would I start now? I shovel another spoonful of mashed potatoes into my mouth. Even though I had a huge breakfast this morning, I am starving, probably because I didn't eat anything for dinner. So, I ask between mouthfuls. So, he asks, that's it. Don't you think it's sort of strange? Not really, I reply. He's a jerk. He probably did something bad and is hiding because he doesn't want to face the consequences. But saying goodnight to your parents and then disappearing in the middle of the night, he asks. No note? No nothing? Was there a sign of a struggle? I ask. What? No. Why would you ask that? Because then it means he left by his own free will. I say, come on, you know how much I love crime documentaries. If there's no sign of struggle, no breaking and entering, he probably just left in the middle of the night, probably to do something illegal. Guarantee you he's back by the weekend. Javier hesitates, then asks, What did Jake talk to you about yesterday? What? During gym. He said something to you. It looked like you got into a fight. You think I had something to do with his disappearance? I say. Because, yeah, I've seen a lot of crime shows. If I was the last person to speak to Jake, especially to have an argument, then I'm the number one suspect. Great. Frustration grows inside me. It's not like I wanted to be on Jake's radar or Gabby's or Melvin's. I want them to all to leave me alone. I want Javier to leave me alone too. What? Javier asks. No, I don't think you made him disappear. I mean, no offense, but I'm pretty certain Jake wouldn't have any issue defending himself against you. The anger in me bubbles. The ring burns ice hot on my finger. Oh, so you think I'm weak? I can't defend myself? Javier's mouth widens in shock. Caden, that's not it at all. What in the world has gotten into you? I, I thought we just made peace. But I barely hear his words. Blood pumps so loudly in my ears that I can't hear anything at all and beyond Javier's shoulder, I can see the shadowy ghost, can feel his smile even though I can't see his face and the anger burns against my fear. Are you okay? Javier asks for the millionth time. He reaches out for my shoulder. Don't touch me, I yell out. I leap from the seat and crash into a kid walking behind me. Hey, the kid yells. I shove him back in response. He falls into another kid and the whole cafeteria goes silent. The shadowy figure is gone, but I know he's still there. I can feel him, can feel his anger, his rage, can feel it becoming my own. Caden, Javier says softly, come on, just sit down. But I can't sit down. The anger burns and everyone is staring. Before I can say anything else, before one of the teachers can come over and ask me what's wrong for the millionth time, I turn from the table and run. No one tries to stop me, not even Javier, and that makes me even angrier. I run down the hall, but I don't leave the school. Instead, I yank open the door to the bathroom and shut myself inside. Once there, I go to the sink and turn on the water and scrub my hands. The water gets hot fast, but I don't turn it down. The scalding pain feels good. It burns away the heat of my anger, the bite of my fear, the cold of the ring. I splash the hot water on my face, trying to jolt myself out of it, trying to come back to myself. Every movement aches. When I woke up this morning, I was sore all over. My shoulders ached, my calves were tight, and even though I told myself it was because of Jim, I know the truth. As much as I try to fight it, I remember the dream. Only now, I don't think it was a dream, after all. So what does Caden mean when he says, I don't think it was a dream after all? Share with your fellow listener. I remember going to Jake's house. I remember bringing him back to the manor with impossible strength. I remember locking him in the basement, just like all those kids that had been locked away years ago. I'm becoming just like Miss Hoffweller. I'm becoming a monster. 
I'm sorry, I whispered to Jake. Tears rolled down my face. I don't know if they're from frustration or pain or fear. I didn't mean it. I didn't mean for any of this to happen. Didn't mean for any of what to happen, comes a voice behind me. I jolt and look around. Javier's followed me. What do you think's going to happen now? Share with your fellow listener. Caden, Javier says slowly, gently, like he's trying to calm a cornered dog. What is going on? Come on, you can tell me. This isn't like you at all. I open my mouth to speak, but right as I'm about to, I see a shape behind Javier, the ghost of the one-eyed boy. He shakes his head slowly, gesturing again with his finger that if I speak, Javier will be killed. I I can't, I gasp. Caden, you don't understand, I say. He's watching me. He knows. Javier looks over his shoulder. The ghost vanishes in that motion, but I know that even if it was still there, Javier wouldn't be able to see it. Who? Caden, no one is here. I try to speak. Nothing comes out. Javier watches me for a little longer. Then he sighs. I'm worried about you, he says. You've been acting so strangely lately, growing distant. It isn't like you. Not at all. My body shakes. In an instant, it feels like someone has poured cold water over my skin. Every muscle in my body tightens just for a moment. And when my muscles relax, it feels like I'm back in a dream. Like I'm watching this all through someone else's eyes. Everything feels distanced, removed. Well, maybe you don't know me that well, I state. My voice is strange. It doesn't sound like me. It's too gravelly, too gruff. The words leave my mouth before I can stop them. They aren't what I wanted to say at all. It's clear my words hit home. Javier winces and takes a step back, clearly hurt. What? I didn't ask you to come in here, I continue. I don't want your help or your concern. Caden, don't you get it? I ask. I don't want you around, weirdo. Get out. Javier takes another step back. There's a pain in his eyes I've never seen before. In my head, I scream out my apologies. I can't open my mouth can't move my arms. I am trapped in my own body and I I can't do a thing to change it. Instead, I stand there glaring at him, my fists clenched. If that's how it is, he finally says. He turns and leaves, letting the door close behind him. A few seconds pass and then I turn around to face the grubby mirror, to see my face and the shadow's face and for a horrifying moment, I once again can't tell which is actually mine. You will tell no one, I whisper in that same gravelly growl. I smile. You are mine, and there is much work to be done. If you were Javier, would you walk out on Caden right now, abandon him, or would you keep trying to find out what's going on? Share with your fellow listener. And now, moments more of part seven of Possess Me. When I leave the bathroom, it feels like everyone in the school is watching me. In every class, in every hallway, I feel their eyes. I thought I had learned to deal with the curious stares, the angry glares, but this is different. This is new. As I walk down the hall, people aren't just looking at me to make me uncomfortable. They're looking at me because I'm making them uncomfortable. Kids whisper as I pass or stare over their shoulders when the teacher isn't looking. The only person who isn't watching me is Javier. He avoids me in class, sitting as far away as possible. He looks the other way when we pass in the halls. Just like yesterday, I've pushed him away. This time, I don't think I can pull him back. This time, I don't want to pull him back. We'll find out what happens between Caden and Javier and a whole lot more as... Possess Me continues.